Hey everyone, I am Kristen Veganis, the lead actress in I Am Lisa, and you are watching Two Geeks Talking. What inspirations were you drawing upon to, to make her so realistic and believable? Yeah, well, I typically do try to draw from my own life and experiences as much as I can because it's what is fullest in my brain and heart. When I have a new character, my first thought is always, how am I similar to this person? How am I different from this person? And so for Lisa, her and I are similar in our like little snarky kind of side comments. I'm probably a bit more outspoken than she is. I think she's a little more introverted than me, but we all have those moments. I mean, I've certainly been in the mood to just crawl into a good book in times like that. Then as Lisa evolved and changed, I could add a little bit more bravery and, and strength and like gusto into her and stuff. Uh, obviously I've never planned on <laughs> eating people so that one i had to sort of <laughs> uh stretch the imagination a little but then again you think you've never had that inclination but if you dig deep enough and have to get there you can imagine a time when you've thought about someone in your life that you would maybe <laughs> want to just kind of destroy so <laughs> hi i'm patrick gray and i'm the director editor and producer of i am lisa and you are watching two geeks talking uh, first day on set what was the the energy about the first scene once that was done for me it was relief because i hadn't worked with kristen before the rest of the cast i had worked with in the past on various other projects luckily she was awesome <laughs> and she was like we she and i kind of had this psychic energy going where we would kind of read each other's minds on on where we wanted the scene to go and the the changes that we wanted to make and, and vice versa so there was a sense of relief because i knew right then after after day one this was going to go well because day one can usually tell you how things are going to go for the whole shoot. We did a lot of dialogue scenes those first couple days in that house, even though we, we did have a moment where we were uh, surrounded by police, but that wasn't our fault. <laughs> we had apparently a, there was a house that got robbed a couple houses down from where we were filming out of the blue, like cops closed down the street and were like, swarming the house that we were filming in and immediately i was just like oh my god what do we do turns out that the guy some guy had robbed a house a couple houses down and he had stolen like a bunch of really expensive cuban cigars from the house next door and just dumped them in the backyard i'll, I'll go first uh hi everybody i'm eric winkler i am the writer and executive producer of i am lisa and you are watching two geeks talking what did you have to go through to really get to that final stage that you were like, all right, this is all I can do? Yeah, 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 to get to that point where you just have to put the pencils down. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's really the bulldog thing in me. You're right, I, I, I remember Lady Gaga was, it, you know, the first time she was interviewed by Howard Stern, he was like, what's it like releasing a new album? And she said it was like showing the world her vagina. <laughs> and that's really true. You have to kind of, you gotta be strong-willed because it is your baby and you put so much of yourself into it. But you no, know, it was a learning process for me. You know, I, you know, they always say, uh, don't underestimate your audience. And I was just, it was just too much. And it was basically unfilmable. So uh, I obviously, I don't blame Kristen in any way for passing on it initially because it needed a lot of work, but yeah, I just got as many people to read it as I possibly could. I would take good ideas from anybody who was willing to give them to me. Through that collaboration, we made something better than I could ever hope to do by myself. And, you know, I, I found that collaboration to be nothing short of absolutely exhilarating. So I, you know, the hope is someday I can just uh, work on movies for a living. And it's funny you mentioned rewrites because I'm actually working on uh, the rewrites for Lisa 2 right now. Like I have the uh, program open up on my computer right now, so it's uh, it's 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 a lot of fun. So a lot of hard work, but it's not really work if you enjoy doing it. Weirdly, I'm not introverted in the slightest. Um, if you any if you've ever met me in person, I'm fairly loud and um, outgoing. Uh, in college, I was I did theater. The real question then, and we'll get to the art in a second, how have you stayed sane all these years? <laughs> by, by doing, by, by writing and drawing as much as possible. Uh, you know, it always kept me grounded. You know, there, uh, up until a little while ago, I had two jobs. You know, I work in printing uh, and 
uh, you got to do what you got to do. So, you know, working two jobs, the only thing I could really do to keep myself focused and sane was to draw and to, to write uh, and to keep doing this stuff. About two and a half years ago, I was in a very serious car accident. Mm. Uh, I was uh, driving home from work and a car basically hit a car in the oncoming lane and then bounced, hit me head on, caused the car to roll over. I woke up hanging from the the seatbelts. Then my worst fear was my hands got mangled. Uh, I broke broke my right hand uh, here, so I was all bandaged up, and my drawing thumb. I don't know if you can see how giant this thumb is, yeah. was torn open Oof. and bent backwards. Uh, so there was a real fear that was I going to be able to draw again. You know, I had both hands bandaged up for months. The pain in my hands, I went through the physical therapy and all that. But I had to draw, you know, just because that's my nature. I need to draw. Uh, so I basically teach myself how to draw with a drawing thumb that doesn't bend. Mm. You know, so it was it was challenging, but goes to show you the lengths that I will do to draw and tell stories. Talking about 80s cartoons, though, I mean, that's that's the decade I grew up in as well, too. You know, obviously, we, we have our favorites in general, but which 80s cartoons that kind of influenced you in your style? It had to be a lot of the Looney Tunes, of for course. one thing. The Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, mm-hmm. He-Man, G.I. Joe, Shira, mm-hmm. and as weird as it is to say, if anybody remembers this uh, cartoon, the filmation Ghostbusters and the real Ghostbusters. I think I remember the real Ghostbusters more than the the other series you mentioned. Yes, the filmation. I find it's a hidden gem really worth checking out. Okay. However, I should also point out that the writing back in the day, especially when it came to character depth and how characters were treated, Nowadays, we would see how problematic that is, and I intend to point that out in Cupcake War Machine. It's one of the very few serious sites that I intend to explore that, for one thing, throwaway characters. Mm. Is it right to treat a character this way, that when they die or leave, we just pretend they don't exist anymore because they're not useful to us anymore, like a tool? Is this the way you treat your friends? Mm. It sounds like lazy writing, to be perfectly honest. Like they wrote themselves into a corner or or the character they personally didn't like, but maybe the fans enjoyed. That and also back in the day, and my, my older brother has pointed this out, God bless him. Back in the day, a lot of these cartoons were made to sell toys. So mm-hmm. a lot of character of the days, whether they were heroes or villains, were really disguised as toy commercials, which is another thing I don't like. Yeah. A character is a work of art to be respected within themselves. If they're not serving a purpose to the story, just cut them out. <laughs> it's what I do. I'm Russell Lissau, writer and co-creator of The Hard Ways, and you're watching Two Geeks Talking. That, that whole uh, aspect of um, um, the likeness and people in this uh, fictional work are truly that they are fictional type situation. Yeah, there there are a lot of likenesses throughout throughout the hard ways. Um, one of the things that uh, we struggle to do in independent comics is fund them. It, it is it is expensive to make a comic book, to pay the art team, uh, to pay the printer, to to distribute a book. But one of my favorite things with crowdfunding. Um, and this has been successful for me when I've been involved in Kickstarters, is to offer to have a, to have you, to have the sponsor, drawn into a comic book. People really like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've done that with nearly all of my self-published or independent comics, um, where for what I think is a relatively low fee, you can have your name appear in a comic book, uh, or for a different fee, uh, you could have your your face. You could physically appear in this comic, uh, either as a character or as a background character, um, and that has worked spectacularly well with the hard ways. Um, there's more than a dozen real people uh, scattered throughout all five chapters, um, either in names or in likenesses, and sometimes both. Um, and uh, for the most part, there are people who. Uh, are paying to have the book uh, drawn uh, and lettered and uh, to to see it be published. 
Um, you know, without them, I wouldn't have the funding to pay Sean when I'm paying Sean. I wouldn't have the funding to pay uh, Josh Southall, the letterer. Uh, it's it, it's a it's a wonderful way to to crowdfund a project, and it allows my friends to say, "Hey, look, I'm going to comment." You probably don't know this, but I used to be a competitive fencer when I was younger. Um, I was nationally ranked, and I had a, a coach at one time who said, you know, when I lost a bout, you're allowed to be upset about it for 30 seconds because you, you do have to have acknowledge those emotions, but then you need to move on. Um, as this series has evolved though from a writer's perspective though what has been the hardest aspect of writing this series and what's been the most enjoyable the hardest is time management uh this this is now a full-time gig for me for those of who, who who run their own business and 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 don't know the the aspects of you have to handle the the taxes and all the administrative side uh, i do a lot of cons during the year when there's not a pandemic mm -hmm. and so you have to apply to the cons you have to put together travel arrangements and hotels and local taxes and if you're out of state take locals you know state taxes and you know everything in between so that takes an enormous amount of time so you know one of my greatest challenges is actually being having time to be creative at mm -hmm. this point so i really have to lock in that time management, get what absolutely has to be done on the administrative side so I can go be creative and, and produce more things. Obviously, I, I don't like doing the, admin. Who, who likes doing administrative tasks? I mean, that's just, that's not very fun. And I actually include social media in that as well, because that is an administrative task, whether you like it or not. And then sometimes you just have to be social on social media <laughs> and and because that's actually fun you know you talk to people and, and exchange ideas and, and have a good time but i think the most the most enjoyable thing is when i come up with a new storyline or whether it takes the characters to a place i hadn't thought they were going to go before hmm. and that's always a lot of fun hi i'm george McHale, uh creator of resilience and you're watching two geeks talking but why was this an important story to to tell out of your mind? Um, this is a, this is a personal story um, for me. You know, we've I, I broke my back um, um, in 2014. Uh, I had heart surgery when I was 15 years old. So um, I wanted to kind of um, explore those concepts of someone being injured, being knocked down, and then getting back up again. Um, at the same time, though, I wanted to kind of not tell like a boring drama of you know <laughs> that, that, that's just not my jam I, I i'm you know i like i like kung fu movies and i i like tarantino that's a huge call thank you um and i i love those uh that, that type of genre of of action and, and thriller and uh, you know so that that's the story i wanted to tell um but i really wanted the characters to be relatable for for the reader to care about them so you know that's why we really put them through the paces and and you see what they're made of and you see and it's about a husband and wife you know it, the the female character uh, her name's Jolanda uh, she's named after my wife and uh, you know she she is the lead but it's, it, it, the the story really talks about their relationship and and really kind of showing up for somebody and being there for your partner when when they when they need them most right and so we start off with the couple struggling with the uh, uh, infertility problems and and then later in the story we see um them dealing with this this huge injury that she's had so um yeah that i i don't like it when when the carnage hits and they have and and the story hasn't done the groundwork to to establish the, the characters it kind of feels like a video game at that point and, there, and there's no emotional connection so that that's why we really tried to build this uh, into the story hi my name is rod espinoza creator of adventure finders snow queen and a bunch of other titles like utopia and prince of heroes you are watching two geeks talking how have you improved your skill set with the ever-changing style of 
of digital artwork? Yeah, that's a that's a very good question. I think I my skills took a quantum leap around the time I was working on the history books was because I was forced to do accurate faces. You know, like I was actually conscious about trying to do a George Washington face as best as I can, even in a cartoon form or a Ben Franklin, you know, Ben Franklin's body. That's how I. That's how I got used to drawing, like, you know, <laughs> the un unheroic like bodies, like round round people, you know. So mm. uh, that's uh, it. Just expands your horizon that way, you know. That, and then of course I also drew uh, uh, Abraham Lincoln. You know, I have to draw him sort of the he has to sort of look like Lincoln. You know, so mm -hmm. uh, it got me a lot of practice that way. And lately, I've been practicing more on how to shade people's skin and faces. So with my latest works with the Second Sight LLC, they have a lot of uh, they have a lot of black characters. So I'm learning how to draw and color really good um, brown and dark skin because there's there's slight differences. In the past, I wasn't able to notice this because I, you know, it was always like just flesh, you know. Mm -hmm. It's just light colored flesh. This is what I'm used to coloring, but I'm like, oh, wait a minute. There's nuances in how to shade uh, properly, you know, uh, a black skin that'll, that'll be accurate and that'll look kind of real, you know, or kind of right. <laughs> I don't know how to describe it. Just some of my past, works they just look wrong because i don't have that experience but now that i'm gaining more experience i'm like okay i can see where i made a mistake there or even in just features like i'm practicing more on the facial features you know and you know even even just uh shading hair you know mm. so a lot, you can learn a lot from new projects that way it's great to see that you know you've taken a, a long career that you have and you've you've done good in the world not only with the you know the tuberculosis but with your own personal self as as a creator i mean it's it's difficult to be an artist in itself but the fact that you're you're writing and drawing and you know still remaining relevant with true. your own self like i said before i wouldn't be able to say this if you know if it didn't happen to me that's why i'm glad it finally happened it happened late I mean, it happens early to some people. Uh, that's why I'm very happy when that happens to them. Because I said, man, at least you don't have to suffer for 20 years. <laughs> but I'm still glad that it happened, even if it's late. I'm still glad that, you know, finally my investment paid off. Because it would be embarrassing if it didn't, <laughs> but, uh, but it did. So <laughs> I'm glad that it happened. Hi, I'm Mark Stokes, creator of Zombie Boy Comics. And you're watching Two Geeks Talking. She led into me for about 45 minutes because no, art's not subjective. This is what the artist is trying to, to, to convey. It's like, well, to a certain extent, yes. But when it comes to the amount of media that is consumed on such a rapid basis, whether it's Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, Snapchat, whatever, a minute's worth of time is apparently too long for some people. That, that's that's a really good point. And I'd like to kind of talk about that for a second. Uh, I, I think that we're in a time, we're in a, a fantastic, exciting time, yeah. but that has its pros and its cons. Mm. One of the pros is, and it's probably the same thing as it is a con. The pro is, oh my gosh, look at this buffet that we have here that we can look at. The problem with it is you only have so much time to absorb and you and really for me frankly i get overloaded I, i'll be uh going on instagram and i'll be scrolling you get to a point where you're just oversaturated i cannot look at any more art or or what somebody else is doing that seems a lot more successful than me <laughs> you have to sort of just detach a little bit from it because i think that it'd be wonderful to be able to go into the louvre for instance mm. and in, in an hour see everything that's in the louvre and I've never been to the Louvre, but I've heard that you can't even spend a day in one room in the Louvre. There's so much there. Yeah. So you imagine cranking and packing all that into 
a one hour or two hour experience. How are you going to savor something that you really like when you have all this other stuff? It's like a buffet and you just it's just rolling by and you pick out what you want. Mm -hmm. The problem with that is, I don't know about you, but I can only eat so much food at a buffet. You know, I used to be one of those people that would just pile my my plate like to like a mountain full of food. But now I only can just eat just, I'll eat just what I think I can eat in one plate and then I can always go back. Yeah. But by the time you finish your first plate, you're done. Uh, but on the other side of that is as a creator, you are just uh, uh, one little tiny um, part of that menu. You know, you that buffet is international and it's huge. And uh, you can get lost in the buffet, you know? For sure. There's there's so much competition and so many people trying to do the same thing that you're trying to do. Hi, I'm Raven Perez, creator of Raven's Dojo. That's ravensdojo.com, where you'll find Raven's Dojo, the comic, over 1,200 pages free, as well as my side comics like Devil Powered Witches, Home, Fuck Button, and more. And you're watching Two Geeks Talking. Social media is, is a, a black hole when it comes to being a creative person. My content okay. gets lost. Your content gets lost. Everyone that I've interviewed is is posting so much more only to be consumed in 30 seconds. And I'm glad you brought it up because it's like you talk about like, oh, what is the big change for Raven's Dojo? Like, um, you know, I think about in terms of like that, just what you just said. Mm -hmm like it's like to throw all this stuff out there constantly and just kill yourself or whatever else it's like uh you know just to have an algorithm bury you yeah. or whatever it's like hey man you know uh i kind of was still running a rat race in my head i was still in my head thinking um you heard me talk like i said oh i was only doing three pages but now i'm doing five pages and all this stuff and uh you know I'm kind of like, I'm just going to take my time and make the book a year. Like, I love that pace. It's a great pace for me. It keeps me, like, from getting stagnant. Like, I can't sit around and get too navel-gazy for too long. <laughs> but at the same time, like, I'm not doing it to pump content into uh, an ever fill an, an, an ever empty glass. Like, I know you've heard the metaphor that social media and web content is, like, pouring water into a glass that never fills, right? And uh, anybody that's made content can relate to that. Um, and it's a shitty feeling, and I really think that we, we could all, like every creator, could benefit greatly from just sort of stepping the fuck back and being like, hey, look, you know, um, none of this is as important as what it feels like what we really just need to do is just focus on making work that we fucking love and work that has passion in it and that people can connect to. And it's like, Hey man, you know, if you get buried under like somebody that does 50 million post-it sketches and, or like, you know, they can do like a 30 second TikTok of them being like, and like, that's the, you know, that gets like 70,000 likes and like yeah. you poured like eight hours into a page and it gets like one like or something like that. Yeah. It's like, Hey man, you know, don't feel bad there is this whole structure was not built for what comic artists do yeah it wasn't built for what most anybody does like this whole structure is advertising centric when i started the internet in 1998 like raven's dojo went up and advertising was setting the tone then and it's crazy that advertising still setting the tone for what goes online but if you look at what, like the way advertising works is it just needs eyes. It doesn't matter what is drawing the eyes there. It could be a dog shitting or it could be like a masterpiece, but advertisements don't give a shit. Yeah. All that matters is that you're there. And it's it's like everything's impermanent and it's all like, oh, everything, everybody's making content. It's like, no, dude, I've seen artists push back. I'm glad the conversation's happening. I've seen artists push back and be like, I don't make content, I make music. Like I make a fucking album. Like I'm making stories, like I do this stuff. I think the people making content are uh, vloggers, like YouTubers and Twitch streamers. And that's fine. Yeah. That's actually like that describes, like right now the internet is geared towards video 
and it's geared towards streaming and like that perfectly describes like what they do like reactions you know it's what what would you call that like uh, other than content it's like me watching something else and you're just looking at like how i react to it and that's content you know it's disposable it's junk food it's not bad it's just it is what it is yeah. but it's like i think a lot of creators get tied up in that rat race and it's like nah man we gotta unplug from that shit and just connect back to our work yeah. like just make it on our own time schedule you know? Hey guys, Frank Forte here, creator of Warlash, Asylum of Horrors, Undead Evil, Billy Boy, Vampire Versus, and a bunch of other indie comics from the 90s, 2000s, and beyond. I've also worked on Bob's Burgers, the comic book and TV show, Solar Opposites, Lovecraft Country, Conjuring the Devil Made Me Do It. Go back and forth between storyboards and comics. And I'm here today on Two Geeks Talking to talk comics. It's a lot, of, a lot of times, a lot of artists and creative people in general, because either they're introverted or maybe they just, they don't like the spotlight sometimes. They don't usually promote themselves uh, with what they do. I think that's a lot of it too, is, is like, they're not into the self-promotion or they're not doing something on the side. They don't have a comic book or a web thing or, or they're not into just tabling at a convention. Look, that's a whole, you know, doing the convention, getting a table, making your merch, you know, having a banner, promoting yourself, you know, going there and trying to sell eight hours a day for like two or three days. It's, you gotta be a certain person to do it. I mean, I've been doing it since I was like 19, you know, it's early nineties, I was sitting there in New York at the, at the conventions in Boston, all on the East Coast, and just selling my wares. Like, I just was like, this is what I have to do. Like, I, I sent out a, and I wasn't even that good, but I sent out a bunch of letters to DC and Marvel and all that shit, and I got rejected. And early on, I was like, well, screw this. I'm just gonna do it myself. Like, I don't, what am I gonna do? Wait for someone to, to, to accept me and publish me? Hell no, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna do my own comics get them printed at a printer. I know how to talk to a printer because I was in graphic design and I figured out how to talk to distributors and, you know, I just figured out the whole process. So I was doing it early on and it just seemed like, why, why wait for these gatekeepers to allow me to, you know, I, I don't need your approval to put something out. I'm just going to do it, you know? So that's what I did. Kind of been doing it doing it ever since you know i think that's a lot of it too is, is like they're not into the self-promotion or they're not doing something on the side they don't have a comic book or a web thing or or they're not into just tabling at a convention look that's a whole you know doing the convention getting a table making your merch you know having a banner promoting yourself you know going there and trying to sell eight hours a day for like two or three days it's you got to be a certain person to do it i mean i've been doing it since i was like 19 you know it's early 90s i was sitting there in new york at the at the conventions in boston all on the east coast and just selling my wares like i just was like this is what i have to do like i, I sent out a and i wasn't even that good but i sent out a bunch of letters to dc and marvel and all that shit and i got rejected and early on i was like well, screw this. I'm just going to do it myself. Like, I don't, what am I going to do? Wait for someone to, to, to accept me and publish me? Hell no. I'm going to, I'm just going to do my own comics, get them printed at a printer. I know how to talk to a printer because I was in graphic design and I figured out how to talk to distributors and, you know, I just figured out the whole process. So I was doing it early on and it just seemed like why, why wait for these gatekeepers to allow me to, you know, I, I don't need your approval to put something out. I'm just going to do it, you know. So that's what I did. Kind of been doing it, doing it ever since, you know. Hi, I'm Mitzi Bahit, creator of Carnival and The Nowhere Tree. You're watching Two Geeks Talking. Let's start off and we'll get into from Carnival. We'll go into Nowhere Tree as well, too, for sure. It's creating comics or getting into comics usually isn't a spur of the moment decision. How did you decide you wanted to get into comics? Hmm, that's a good question. Actually, um, I was a comic reader, a passive comic reader back in college. Um, I'm part of a, um, an organization, a comic organization back in our college. 
and we managed to put up an anthology like a five page six page anthology uh six page per artist um and we managed to compile all that and sell it to um comic con or comic with a k mm -hmm. um in a like uh like a decade ago and uh, um ever since we uh, um we we experienced that selling our work i felt like elated down because i had to graduate i had to um get a decent job and all and so the kind of take a back seat um and then i realized now when i quit my job and did my first comic and self-publish it on my own um th there was that feeling that gut feeling that i i enjoy doing this even though it's crammed um even though there are silk sleepless nights to just to um to finish it on time and yeah it's, it's pretty worth it in writing this book you had to reach out to the survivors as well too you had to reach out to those people that were fighting constantly for for decades to get this democracy that they had yeah. what, what was the first thought that came to mind when it, learning their stories about these this uh, issue that they were going through yeah the biggest thing was the difference between how i felt about it and how they, they felt about it because i was just completely fascinating fascinated excited about every detail and you know when you interview people now these are you know my wife's friends from college these are her teachers these are people she knew so it's not like we were just approaching complete strangers but still you gotta wonder like we're you know i'm asking them to give me the the details about times they broke the law like some of the most traumatic things they've done and like very personal details about their their lives and not a single one of them was like no i, I don't want to talk about it they were all like I'll tell you whatever you want, but who's going to want to read about it? Hmm. Because to them, it was like it was Tuesday. You know, it was just their normal lives. It's kind of like, you know, the situation people went through living through a pandemic and a lot of the things that have happened in the world in the last year. If, if you told that story to anyone before 2020, it would have been this amazing story. But now everyone's been through it. So they're like, what what makes me special? Like everyone has a story like that where in Korea, everyone of that generation has stories like this. And so to them, they don't imagine, you know, even Hyunsuk didn't imagine. She's like, why would anyone want to read a book about my college life? Uh, but for people who haven't been in that situation, it's a wild uh, experience that kind of is relatable and also unimaginable in, in many different types of ways. Do you find that the story is, is relevant today in terms of today's political culture around the world yeah we could not have imagined when we started working on it how relevant it was going to be but like af after we written the script like politicians of the day would like repeat almost word for word something i'd written in the script <laughs> or like you know the just history just kept repeating itself and you know seeing images on the news that looked like images that were in the book and uh you know when we when we started the book, it was like, well, here's this obscure bit of history maybe people might be interested in. And then by the time the book came out, like AV Club was saying, it's impossible to imagine uh, a, a time when this book would be any more relevant. I'm like, oops, all right, I made a relevant book. <laughs> Hi, I'm Sam Johnson, creator of Geek Girl and Carpaccini, Voodoo Junkie, Hit Mama, and you're watching to Geeks Talking. With all of these series that you're writing, with Geek Girl being your your primary one, you know, how are you able to for your story arcs? How are you able to really kind of make sure that your ideas don't bleed from one genre to the other? Um, well, I mean, I, I'm not opposed to there being a bit of a, a genre crossover. I mean, Carver is, is a very different character to Kika, so her miniseries has, has a bit of a horror element to it. Um, so, I mean, my main sort of aim with, with what I'm introducing to Geek Girl is, is weird. So they, uh, I, I always reference Grant Morrison, Doom Patrol influence, like if you like the, 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 the excellent 
TV series of Doom Patrol and it's also ha very heavily inspired by what Grant did. Um, that's the kind of thing I'm, I'm introducing to what is, you know, a, a, Primarily, it's it's a, a college world that we, that we meet Ruby and her, her BFF Summer and, and her mean girlfriends in. But now, because of what's happened with her as a superhero, she's now uh, out of college and is, has got this gig front in a super team. So it's it's a super team book, but there's quirkiness and weirdness to it, and I'm not like putting any restrictions on on what you know if, what genre that may my take. Uh, what's going on here? Hello, I'm Jen Wicked, creator of Queen of Assholes, Have Tablet Will Scribble, Crap I Drew on My Lunch Break, and much, much more. You're watching Two Geeks Talking! And you're watching Two Geeks Talking. I don't see no geeks. <laughs> Am I a geek? Does that make me a geek? Well, what would you like to be? <laughs> What's the most misunderstood aspect of autism that people don't understand? This is all still relatively new to me because I've kind of just recently figured this out about myself, but I think maybe of what I have encountered so far, at least for me, it's felt like I get blamed a lot for things I can't necessarily control um, in the sense that, for example, I tend to take things literally when, when people say things to me, unless it's extremely obvious that uh, they're not being literal. Um, and so, you know, I have frequently been accused of being like difficult on purpose or you know being antagonistic on purpose or that kind of thing like people neurotypical people assume that one that you're always aware of what you're doing which you can be but it's a process to get to that point um I have a really severely bad habit of putting my foot in my mouth, you know, so I'll be trying to say something that I really have good intentions and it will just come out as like a horrible insult when it leaves my mouth. And it's like, this, that is the complete opposite of what I meant. Mm -hmm. um, and you try to like backpedal and explain yourself and they're just like, ah, why are you doing this? Ah! You know, like I, whoa, you know, but that's not what I meant. You know, I, I call you an idiot because I like you. I know it doesn't make sense to you, but it made sense up here when it came out my mouth. Um, <laughs> so I, I think that's the biggest part of it is like, I think sometimes it's hard for neurotypical people to conceptualize the different process that goes on inside your head. I have, I, I read the other day, they called it web thinking, but I have a very kind of interlocked visual thinking style. I think in images and I make all these strange associations in my head that may not be obvious to other people. Um, and then I can act based on that. And it's made me very observant and it's made me create some really interesting artwork where I kind of collage all these strange images to say whatever it is I'm trying to say, but um, it's not a deliberate process you know i i don't go out of my way to be difficult i don't go out of my way to be antagonistic and i wish that um i wish that people would have maybe a little more patience uh, and a little more compassion for somebody that does have persistent communication issues so for me that's probably been the most uh, misunderstood aspect is like I know that I look normal and I, okay, for varying definitions of look normal, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I, I, I don't look like there's anything wrong with me per se. Mm -hmm. um, but that doesn't mean that I don't have a problem. Just like when 
someone parked in the handicap parking space at the grocery store and gets out and walks into the store, you know, just because they're not on crutches or in a wheelchair doesn't mean that they're fine and they're parking in a handicapped space for no reason. Hmm. Um, these things are invisible. You can be upfront about them. You can disclose them. Um, but still, I feel like people maybe don't have as much patience as they should for for someone that, that does have these kind of developmental differences. Hi, I'm Sean Kleefeld, author of Comic Studies series Web Comics, and you're watching Two Geeks Talking. But the average person doesn't know about web yeah. comics. How does your book translate to the average person? Well, that that goes back to um, part of how I defined web comics in the first place. Is you know, I, I think it's there's a lot of people you think of your you know your penny arcades, your PVPs, your girl geniuses. You know, there's a lot of old school staples of web comics, and that's if if somebody does know web comics that's what they tend to think of um and if they don't know web comics if they don't think of themselves as web comic readers um then they'll have no clue of any of those they'll never heard of any of those and they're like well i just i don't even read comics kind of thing um but as i was kind of doing research and kind of looking at defining web comics um one of the things that I found that was interesting is that really, honestly, everybody is reading web comics, whether they know it or not. Well, if you're if you're online, I should say, I qualify that you do need to be online. But as long as you're online, you're, you're just, there's a very good chance that you're reading web comics and you might not even know it, um, because a lot of memes that are out there are in a comic format, and they don't seem like it because they're using frequently using still clips from movies or TV shows or, or what have you. And you recognize that as, okay, here's, uh, you know, Mark Hamill and Carrie Fisher and Harrison Ford from Star Wars. And, you know, they're having, uh, somebody's put together some kind of like comedic banter uh, among the three of them. And you kind of know the characters and even, and, you know, there's a joke at the end of it. Uh, you know, there was, there was one going around when the latest round of Star Wars movies came out of, you know, uh, Harrison Ford wondering whether or not, you know, he even wears, is, am I supposed to wear a hat in this movie or not? Or is, <laughs> or is that the, was that the other franchise? I can't remember, right? And it's kind of those kind of conversations. Yeah. And the jokes, you know, you can, you can judge their quality in and of themselves. But the format of them, even though they're using still images from movies and from TV shows, that's still a sequential art format, right? You're using, uh, right, there's the, um, you know, uh, Fumetti is all about using photographs to create comics, right? It's the same idea. You're using still shots from these movies, uh, from these TV shows to create comics. And so those show up in, you know, your Facebook your Twitter, your Tumblr, all, you know, whatever social media platform you happen to be on. And they're not as, uh, they're not treated as web comics. They're not usually thought of as web comics because they don't have a homepage. They don't have, um, frequently they don't even have a creator tag to them necessarily. It's just a meme, right? Some one guy created it and it started floating around on, various social media platforms there it's hosted in as uh you know like i said twitter facebook whatever um and all of that stuff is still a form of web comics right they're still comics they're still posted on the web they're still shared on the web they're sent around people are enjoying them uh to whatever degree um and that's that's part of web comics, right? And they, you don't really think about those, I don't think, in terms of uh, of web comics, right? They don't have that homepage like, you know, girlgenius.net or pvponline.com or, or anything like that. Um, they don't have that homepage. They're not served up through uh, Webtoons or, or one of those platforms like that. Uh, they're just floating around it kind of independent. They don't have that long form sequential narrative 
but they're still web comics. They're still comics. They're still de- delivered on the web, and everybody's seeing those, and everybody knows how to read them and knows how to appreciate them, even if they're done crudely, right? You, even if they're they're bad screenshots, they're out of focus. There's bad MS Paint job on top of it to edit out, uh, you know, some detail in the background. Uh, and that bad MS Paint jobs to rechange the captions in a lot of cases. Um, that's all comics. Um, and so even if so, if somebody comes to me and says I don't read web comics, my counter argument is yes, you do. Hmm. <laughs> you know, you don't know it, but you are reading comics. Uh, there, all this stuff that's showing up on social media. You might just call it a meme, but it's a web comic. Hi, this is Alex Schumacher, creator of Mr. Butter Chips and Decades of Inexperience, and you're watching Two Geeks Talking. Would you rather have no more challenges in your life, or would you ha- rather have no more obstacles that stop you from happiness? But yeah, I think I think the obstacles from happiness would be, the the if I could choose, if I had a choice, mm-hmm. that would be the the element that I would remove. Because I think everything else is pretty easy, not easy, but it seems less insurmountable. Whereas obstacles to happiness just completely, I I guess happiness is something that you need in life. (laughs) So not to derail my own, my own thought, uh, you know, train of thought, but I think it's important to be happy and whatever that means. I mean, there's different definitions for everybody. And for me, I'm, I've been working on my own mental health for the last few years. And I think that was an important element that people found during the pandemic, that that was something that they maybe needed to contend with um, in a way that they didn't before. And I think that was true for me also. And, you know, there, there's nobody who's happy and excited 100% of the time. But you can find this baseline, whereas I, I feel like before I, I would just dip into these depressions that were incredibly difficult to crawl out from for you know weeks at a time. So when you're actually facing these issues head on, there's something, I guess, helps with the creative process because you're not necessarily in these, in, you know, have all of that weight of the additional frustration and anxiety and stress. So again, you're going to have days where you don't feel like being productive. You're going to have days where you don't feel like working and that's perfectly fine. I think taking breaks is an essential part of being creative, but getting yourself to a point where you're at least content. I think that's that's incredibly important, and you have to be more concerned with your own personal well-being than anything else, because the, at the end of the day, that's what's most important. And I think a lot of people, especially the younger generation, because they've grown up with it, put a little bit too much stock in social media. And you know, these if their posts don't get a thousand likes or you know, if their impressions are low, they take that as a commentary on their own self-worth, which is incredibly damaging. So I think working on your, just your own, you know, mental fortitude is really one of the most important things you can do, not just as a person, but as a creative too, because that's going to allow you to be able to continue creating if you're in a, you know, decent headspace. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's this sea ocean, this vast ocean of people creating things every day and, and new creators, you know, establishing product pro- projects every day. So, yeah, I mean, that really is what it is, is you just, you know, one shimmer on a sea of, of creative people. You can find an audience online. Mm-hmm. You know, th- that is the nice thing about the Internet. I, you know, it's kind of much maligned when I'm talking to my wife because social media can definitely have it it's you know tribulations and and pitfalls but it also has its promises and its positive aspects as well and i think one of those is finding an audience which you may not have been able to find through other means or through traditional means just you know putting your work in local comic shops or trying to get it published somewhere you know at the internet grant you this direct access to an audience so if you're savvy more savvy than i am (laughs) anyway you know this is an absolute possibility so there there are a lot of positives about social media too i don't mean to 
you know, sit here and harp on all of its <laughs> bad qualities the entire time because for, especially for cartoonists or artists of any kind, starting today, you know, the internet is a huge boon to finding their audience or finding, you know, networking, you know, doing all of those things that are necessary for a person in the arts. Hi, I'm Gary Wills, actor, producer, and entrepreneur. You're watching Two Geeks Talking. What was the most challenging aspect for you, either as an actor, producer, or writer, or all of the above? The, the most challenging aspect of it is to, uh, obviously, me playing such a, a, a such a strong character. You know, I've I've never played a character like this before, um, and to obviously produce, direct, write as well. Um, and to be able to control everything at the same time, it was very, very hard. Um, and I think actually to this day, Rage may have been the hardest project that I've ever worked on. Um, I have shown a few very close people to me, um, some of the takes, and they've told me that um, Rage is like my character in Rage, like that's the best acting that I've ever did. So, which is which is great, you know. So I'm 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 growing and I'm getting better at what I'm doing. Um, but the the character Alex, I play Alex, um, such a strong character, you know. Um, obviously, I grew out the hair for it, uh, the scruffy uh, beard, um, and of course, what helped the most was all. All the other work that I had to do so the producing the writing directing all of that at the same time plus um the product the production manager that we originally had um she had surgery at the time so um she unfortunately had to step back from uh being production manager from rage two months prior to filming which didn't help but we understood um i took over as production manager so all of that stress um and emotion behind all those roles I loaded into the character, which made the character ten times better. It, wow. it was scary. It was really scary. You know, like after the after final day of filming, um, you, you'll see in the movie that I do a lot of shouting and uh, screaming. Um, and a part of the movie, um, I woke up the next morning, lost my voice. It, it took a few days, and I started to actually. I was getting like backlashes from that character, like dreaming some stuff. And it was just scaring me. Um, like I, I'm not a method actor or anything like that, but it was just scaring me a little bit. And I went straight to the barbers, shaved off my hair, got the the facial hair off, showered, like completely, just like refresh, restart, and just sat there and listened to music. And just that was me. Hmm. It's like I, I came back onto the earth again. It was like I was an alien of some sort. <laughs> As a, as a host, though, asking questions, obviously, to keep the flow going when it comes to your guests is obviously very important. Are there a couple of questions you always fall back on that kind of gets them into their frame of mind of having a good conversation with you? Uh, when I start things off, I usually ask them, like, what their third favorite color is mm -hmm. or something dumb like that. Just kind of set set the tone to where we're not going to be completely serious the whole time and that's perfectly fine um, at some point I usually ask them what their favorite Muppet is because nice. I've just found that everybody likes Muppets and I, I don't know they're just wonderful so there's no way you can really get around that but for the most part I don't go in with a lot of questions pre-planned because every person is different every interview is different my reaction to their work has been different or to the topic that we're talking about so like anything that I'm going to ask everybody is a super basic thing. Like in the regular episodes, I will ask uh, what the game gets right compared to the comic, what the game gets wrong. And if they had somebody who wanted to get into that comic, would they give them that game as a primer course? And sometimes that'll have to be amended a little bit like you've got you know batman games where there are some really good ones and i don't you know to try to get around people saying oh you know i wouldn't give them this game because arkham asylum exists i've kind of turned that into like if this is the only batman game that exists would you give them this one as a primer course hi i'm ryan curtis i'm the writer and creator of slums of the empire city a new comic book series and you're watching two geeks talking 
you know, looking at uh, Gangs of New York as as a, a basis, not only for a film, but as a, as a book itself, was there any other literary pilgrimages that you went on to kind of research the characters you wanted to bring into your books? Well, yeah, there, there's a, 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 a small collection of books about the time period here somewhere, um, which I did read through and, and found them fascinating again, just uh, it's such an interesting interesting point in time for me but i think a lot of the stuff came from newspapers um you know the smithsonian has a history of newspapers that are completely searchable they're fairly accurate searches so uh, you know i really wanted to try and find evidence that sadie the goat was a real person and existed so i've spent years and years and years going through these and every so often i'll update you know try changing some words and some search terms to see what you can find. I haven't found any evidence that she actually existed yet, but what I did find were so many interesting, crazy happenstance stories that I thought were so great that I and ended up building into the books. And uh, the, for instance, uh, Harmon and Haley, who are uh, Sadie's two uh, colleagues uh were i found them in a news story about two men Harmon and haley stealing sugar off of a a a ship that was in quarantine sneaking aboard and stealing baskets of sugar and getting caught by the harbor police and (laughs) uh you know being sent to sing sing prison i thought well if there's not two bumbling idiots that (laughs) that uh you know need uh, need sadie's help to succeed uh, i don't know what are so you know so these two men who lived 150 years ago are now in a comic book that they couldn't <laughs> comprehend possibly but here here they are uh, and living and breathing and you know just taking fun stuff like that little incidents where you read about a chimney collapsing into the street and killing some people that's interesting and 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 weird it's certainly not something well i shouldn't say something we don't see now considering there's been a couple terrible collapses lately but um right. you know something different and okay why not so taking these little news stories from the day and putting them in there has been a lot of fun um, Sadie's family in the in the third book um, run a, an oyster saloon, a low oyster saloon called Farrell's Oyster Saloon, um, was a real place, and those are real real people. Whether they're related to Sadie the Goat or not, I, I, we don't think so. But that was actually taken from some newspaper stories at the time, describing this family and and um, some court cases they went through. So it was like hmm, kind of interesting. So again, just using these little these little pieces to to pull and put together into a bigger story it's it's lots of fun hi everyone this is jack mole queen nightlife operator in new york city and writer of nightlife noir new book that is available now on kickstarter you are listening to two geeks talking with kurt sasso with this creative process finally in print format What's your next step as as a creator? A lot of this project was, uh, at least for me personally, a desire to show proof of concept, um, to get a a work out into the world, you know, start engaging with uh, other comic lovers uh, and 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 other creatives within the industry, and be able to share something with them uh, of of my own creation. I found so far in my limited experience, uh, I've never been to a con or anything like that. I think New York Comic Con in October will likely be my first and I've already got the wheels turning on how I can uh, host an after party uh, for that one for all the creators, maybe use a badge as a requirement to get in, like merge my comic life and my and my nightlife life uh in in equal uh measure and i've always enjoyed playing the host so that would that would be um very rewarding to me hi i'm trevor mueller creator of albert the alien and nexus on webtoon and you are watching two geeks talking this is something new this is something like when web comics first came out with that that kind of that push that surge of of amazing creators yeah, you know, it's it's new, but it has sustainability, mm-hmm. right? It has a staying power on it because Webtoon has been overseas a lot longer than it's been here. And it's even more popular over in Southeast Asia than it is here. And it's all over the world. It's in Europe. It's it's in Latam. It's, it's everywhere. Um, you know, you can download a copy of the app. And then some of the originals are actually localized. So they'll they'll tap like Southeast Asia creators for some of the Southeast Asia originals. 
And then if it's popular enough, they'll translate it and they'll bring it over to other territories. Um, so those are those are things that they'll do to just kind of take those those universal stories, right? And it's, it's the same model that anime had back in the day, right? They're just really, really interesting stories. They're really fun, um, you know, characters and, and concepts and things that they have in there. And then they'll just bring them over uh, to other cultures and they, they translate, they, they work well. Nice. Um, Webtoon, I, I'd say from a creative perspective is a really unique challenge. Um, because again, I'm used to writing for the printed page. And so there's a little bit of a formula and, um, uh, and a rhythm that you get into when you're writing for print where, you know, every odd number page, the page turn is like a cliffhanger or a question or something like that. And you can't really do that on Webtoon because unlike regular web comics, where it's usually like a printed page that you just post up onto your website. Webtoon is a vertical scroll. It's a whole bunch of panels just kind of layered on top of each other. Mm. And you, just like you're going through Facebook or a social media feed, like you just keep scrolling to get down to the bottom of it. And that makes the pacing quite different and the formula quite different. So from a creative perspective, it was a unique challenge to kind of figure out how do I tell a story in this way? The other thing that's unique about it too is that they, uh, each of their installments are called episodes, and then they have so many episodes within a season, they call it. And so each of those seasons will roughly translate to about a graphic novel's length. And so you're planning out, you know, an entire graphic novel from the get-go in intricate detail as a part of the pit pro pitch process. Um, and that was really kind of fun and interesting, too. Um, and very different. So again, just like a fun challenge to kind of to kind of um, put out there. And you know, our hope with with Nexus is that we would potentially get more than one season. Mm -hmm. uh, we pitched it as as several, um, but depending on where the numbers are, right? Like we've got a plan where if the numbers to start there and it's not supported, then we can end it at the at the end of season one. Um, you just don't get all the fun little things that we're going to plan for, you know, <laughs> seasons two and on. Um, but you do get a conclusion, right? And and Webtoon very much kind of encourages that model of let's make sure that you have flexibility in your story so that if for some reason readership drops or something like that, you can still get an ending. Whereas with other web comics that are out there and it's just individual creators out there, if they just stop making the comic, it just kind of fizzles out right. and goes away. So it's nice that they'll at least put a period at the end of their stories, which you don't typically get uh, with independent creators doing web comics if they decide to kind of, you know, the numbers aren't there, it's just not worth their time. Hi, I'm Wes Molbash, creator of You'll Have That and Molbashed and the upcoming graphic novel, Travis Davenport for the win. And you're watching Two Geeks Talking. In another interview more recently though, you've also talked about how you felt that the webcomic not passed you by, but it's tougher to become creative in that industry. Why, why do you feel that? It is a, it is a very, how, how do I, at, with all due respect to web comics, because I certainly don't uh, want to poo-poo anybody. Um, I think we have to, you have to pick your battles. That's what my wife always says whenever uh, our kids are arguing with us, right? About what socks they want to put on or whatever. You, know, you pick your battles. Which one do you want to actually fight for? And I think that with web comics, uh, you have to be prepared to constantly um, be looking for the next thing, the next platform, and be ready for, you know, you need to know, understand algorithms, you need to understand how all these platforms work and what's going to work best for you in your, in your creation. So when I made You'll Have That, it was before, I mean, Facebook, I don't think, was open to everybody just yet. I think MySpace was still the main social media network, you know, the cartoon was hosted on the Viper Comics website. And at that time, it was all about having a dedicated site, a hosted site, mm -hmm. um, driving traffic to that site, having some, you know, using ads and merchandise to kind of try to create revenue. And that alone was difficult because, you know, what worked for one person doesn't work for the next person. And that's becoming even more and more that gap wider now with social media and the way, you know, Facebook and Instagram and, and TikTok now, like all these, they use algorithms. So these platforms are kind of what the users get to see based on their habits.
it just it just it's just getting harder and harder to to crack that algorithm to to find an audience now i'm not saying it can't happen and i'm not saying you shouldn't try it i'm just saying there's came a point for me where i was just like golly i don't know i i never really did make a whole lot of money from my web comics you know it becomes a full-time job on top of a full-time job and it's when you have a family, it's it becomes hard to justify to your wife and kids why you spend so much time drawing a cartoon with not a lot of financial return. She was she's always been very supportive of me, but um, there just comes time came a time for me where I had to, okay <clears throat> maybe I need to switch gears creatively and find a new way to make sure I'm always working on something, but that is more conducive to my schedule as a husband and a father and an employee. So that's the long version <laughs> of why I sort of stepped away from web comics. Hi, I'm Chris Falch, the author of the Gold Steel Saga. You are listening to Two Geeks Talking. What was, a, what was an early experience where you learned that language had power? Oh boy, um, I'll expect that question. I, I, I mean, well, I'm trying to come up with an answer for that one. Uh, I mean, I guess I'd have to go back to when I was in school myself. I had, uh, I went to, I was mostly in school here in Newfoundland, but my stepfather version of Nova Scotia, and he used to go back in the, in the winters to do lobster fish. So me and my stepmother went up for him, went with him for two winters in the semester in Nova Scotia and it was it was definitely a big part of my education was just getting that different educational vantage point up there in Nova Scotia and seeing how they do compared to how we did the blue flag because as far as I know that was basically how it was done everywhere the literature teacher I had there she was very open-minded uh, and she embraced all her students different writing styles and and all, and, and especially the ones who were really passionate about and really wanted to tell stories. Miss Fraser was her name, I believe, and she she was the one who really opened my eyes to the possibility of using my words to to tell stories. And a lot of literature teachers I had up to that point had this one particular writing style and had how it had to be in terms of how stories were told and the, the flow of them format and that kind of thing and if you weren't by the rigid standards they were harping on you uh, and telling you to try to conform to the box that they had no literature to be so going to Nova Scotia with this with, with Mrs. Fraser uh, and her and seeing how how many different genres there are and how every author approaches their story differently no one author is going to be able to fit entirely within that box a lot of them might conform to the better parts of it uh, but there, are, everyone's going to have their own different unique style, and no one way of telling your story is invalid. You know, every it's because it just it's it's just too conforming and too confining to try to say this is only one way to tell a story and one way to do it, and criticizing everything that's not within that. She opened my eyes when I came back to Newfoundland to finish off the semester. I had one of those same literature teachers again. And, and he was still a genre stuff, so his fantasy stuff, not very good. It's all oh, it's junk, it's bad, it's that kind of thing. But he couldn't, he couldn't close my eyes to it anymore. He couldn't break my spirit anymore. I've seen how it can be done and not doesn't have to be just this one way. Hi, I'm David Peppos, writer of the OZ, and you're listening to Two Geeks Talking. This second volume, what was the hardest scene for you to write? I think for me, the always the hardest ones, the hardest scenes, believe it or not, it's always the exposition. I think that's something that gets harder and harder and harder each consecutive issue. Because not only do you have to introduce the premise, but you have to introduce what happened in the previous chapter, which gets more and more complicated. But you have to say it in a way as economically as possible and not repeat yourself from the way you said it before. There was a scene we had in our preview laying out like, the, uh, the the silver slippers and what happened to them, and those those are always kind of a challenge for me. Just figuring out like how do I say this in a different way than I did before, um, you know that's sort of it, that that's the vegetables, 
of it all is just making sure that I can keep people up to speed. I will say emotionally the hardest scene, well, I don't want to spoil it. All I'll say is um, the end of issue three, or well, I guess, sorry, chapter three. This is, these are technically chapters three and four. The end of this first, uh, of this third chapter, that was a hard one emotionally. I had to rewrite it a couple of times. I, I, I really like how we, we, we did it. And it's one of those things, once the book comes out, you can ask me, like, what was that supposed to be originally? I changed it in a way that I, I needed to change it. Like, just emotionally, I could not handle it the way that I had it before. And I think that the, it, it, it winds up being a stronger and maybe less alienating choice. So that was definitely a challenging one for a lot of reasons. Hi, my name is Krishna Sadasavam, and I'm the creator of PC Weenies. And I'm also an illustrator. And you can see my work at krishnadraws.com. And you're listening to Two Geeks Talking. Proper heights of people. I was never accurate in that whatsoever. What's your kryptonite as an artist? I've got too many. Uh, <laughs> I think my kryptonite is that I, you know, if I'm being totally candid, I, I tend to fall into the same subject matter uh, when I work and, you know, as I mentioned earlier, it's like illustrator, Adobe illustrator and, and just get going with a more vectorized, simplified, you know, almost like icon based design. And, you know, that's always been something that's been interesting to me. Cause I also like to dabble with retro computing mm -hmm. stuff. So lately I've been getting into my old Macs and, nice. uh, rehabilitating them. And, you know, there's just an aesthetic that I, I really find, uh, to be very interesting. And it's just so simple and it's just, you know, there's not as many, it's not photorealistic, it's all pixel based. Mm -hmm. So my kryptonite would probably be, you know, I just need to go ahead and branch out more uh, with not only some of the tools that I'm using, but also um, just, you know, exploring beyond different subject matter. And, you know, when you're working uh, full time and then you come back and then you're, you know, working on client work, sometimes it just becomes difficult to say, okay, well, what am I going to draw for myself? And you might be able to squirrel like an hour or two where you just have a little bit of time before you have to go to bed. And I go to bed late. I go to bed like around 11, 30, 12, just because I want to have some time for myself where I can do my own thing. But I'm usually giving myself, uh, <laughs> that's usually when I'm on my last ember. So sometimes I just end up drawing the thing that I want to draw. And so I don't know if that's my kryptonite, but I just definitely can see that about me. Um, where I, I would like to kind of push myself even more. And with things like perspective, uh, you know, I don't have a problem with that. And, you know, I, I've had to kind of learn and I found some digital workflows. And, you know, I know that later on we're gonna talk about my YouTube channel, but I'm trying to go ahead and basically disseminate all the tips and tricks that I've gathered over the years and share them with not only my students who happen to watch the videos, but also for anyone who's interested and um, it's just an effort to go ahead and give back to everyone who has been so helpful in, in helping me out to get to where I am. Hi, I'm Jeffrey Burant, co-creator of Killer Bad, and you're watching Two Geeks Talking. How are you gonna be able to, to mix horror but not touch upon the dystopian possible future? A lot of it's pastiche, right? You've seen this before, we're referencing this, you know, we're even doing that with our covers and our imagery. We're making you know that we are referencing slasher movies by our covers and posters, which is a recreation of Killer Bat, I mean, of uh, Friday the 13th, uh, the Friday the 13th movie poster. So we're kind of setting up these worlds by referencing other points in pop culture of, their, of the time uh, that they're in. When we're participating in different genres, you're hitting those genre beats which is another familiar touchstone to your point, maybe more. Uh, also, I would say each issue is kind of how we get to our world building because you, you know, this first issue is just, you're thrown into it. Uh, all this violence happens and then, and who survives and then who survives is the story of, of book two. And then by book three, you're getting the person behind the curtain, what's been really going on this whole time. And it's also taking place on New Detroit, which is um, Det the city of Detroit hovering on giant fans with sewage pouring out uh, in the sky. And so, which is gonna be, it's a fantastic splash page. And so, but, so that's how we reference that dystopian future more. We're putting it in this like kind of cyberpunk 
uh, context that you're used to seeing in other media and then just telling our uh, what is actually kind of like a gothic romantic a horror story for that issue and that kind of uh, you know more spawn like um, where we're we're revealing uh, all the powers that be behind the first two issues you know giving a good satisfying uh, ending to hopefully answer everyone's questions that have built up in the first two. Hi, I'm Stephen Kogan. I'm the creator of the Grow Show, and you are watching Two Geeks Talking. What were some of the the lessons that you learned, especially uh, as as a screenwriter? There's actually separate lessons. One that I would hope everyone kind of who's just starting out would not follow my trajectory on is I'm not a huge fan. I wasn't a huge fan of networking. You know, I said, no, I'd rather stay at home and work on my craft, become the best I can at this. And just, you know, this is what I enjoy. I don't enjoy being out schmoozing and hey, how you doing? How you doing? All that kind of stuff. You really have to, even if you hate it, it's the game you have to play. And because this business is very much a who you know business to get in, it's what you know to stay, but it's who you know to get in. And if you're not out there meeting people, you're not going to know anybody. And so that's one thing, one lesson, hard lesson that I learned. As far as writing, there's, there's no one way to do it. You have to find what works for you that also is going to get others to respond to. I first started just writing, putting my thoughts on the page, no kind of direction to it. And then I said, okay, that isn't working because I'm meandering too much and it, it shows in the work. And so I would start outlining and then I've really focused, uh, they say writing is rewriting. I really focused on getting, getting my rewrites, doing as many as I could and focusing on specific aspects, whether one, one draft was plot or one draft was characters or whatever it was, um, or dialogue, it just really getting it to a place where I thought it needed to be. And then having some idea of the marketing side of it. It's a, a double-edged sword. It, it's valuable, but it's also makes you feel like you're dumbing down your creativity to some kind of one line log line that can fit on a poster. Um, but you kind of have to get past those things and get in the door somehow. And once you're in the door, you may be able to do a little bit more. Now, this was before independent film kind of became a lot easier to do financially. This is back when, you know, you couldn't do something on digital video at a lower budget. And so that kind of changed the game. And that's how I was able to make my first film and do it the way I wanted to do it. Um, although there's a lot of issues with that, which is a whole separate conversation. But those are the kinds of things that I learned, the networking and the, and the rewriting. You have great designs too. Thank I mean, you. the amount of social media presence you need to not only promote yourself, but to keep fresh and relevant and to keep people coming back is always a challenge uh, being a, a business owner. But at the end of the day, like webcomic artists are small business owners and very much it's about in order to be successful, you have to like learn real fast, honestly, all of those skills of brand management, social media management. Like I am so impressed at the work that the kids coming out these days are doing with how active and prolific and just incredibly talented these these younger content creators are when we were coming up and it was very much just that sort of wild west you know cowboy atmosphere of like everybody like throwing darts at a board and hoping something will stick um and you know it is so cool to see how incredibly talented all of these people coming up are. Their quality of artwork um, and story and products um, and just the overall diversity of it all. Um, it's so amazing. And also I love, love so much that web comics are, they are being taken seriously as properties. The Lore Olympus got picked up for a series. If you're looking at the, on the Manhua side, Noblesse and Tower of God were both Korean web comics on Webtoon, not anime series. And that's amazing. Like I haven't checked out Noblesse, but I, I loved the Tower of God uh, anime they made. It was so cool. Noblesse was a, uh beautiful I mean, i've heard the action and the the character development. oh awesome yeah because it's on my list because it's about like vampires right yeah okay cool yeah 
because it's like all political and crazy. Like I'm like, whoa, that sounds awesome. The, if the first five minutes don't grab you, then I will be very shocked. <laughs> I'm excited. I can't wait. Yeah. But I mean, but that's like what I'm saying though, is like, I feel like when we, there was still very much that idea of like, oh, you're putting comics on the internet. That's a fad. <laughs> so it's so awesome. Like, like I wish that, that I could go back to some of, you know, the, the people and show them today of like, look, look, there are things and, and this is a real deal thing. Like, this is awesome. Because yeah, it's just incredible how much more support there is for, um, you know, making a career that there not necessarily was, uh, you know, again, 10, 15 years ago. Hi, I'm Matt Sumo, um, writer, creator of the Bardic Verses. Uh, I've also written Dedication for Double Take Comics, and I have an entry in Dead Beats, uh, which is a Ringo-nominated anthology from Wave Blue World. And you are watching Two Geeks Talking. What's the most misunderstood aspect about being a writer? <sighs> Man, um, if I had to, like, I guess I would say personally, I think the most misunderstood thing is that it's it's not hard work um you know or we do the the least amount of heavy lifting which uh, granted artists you know they do the most amount of heavy lifting but there's a lot of things that we have to do on our end as writers a lot of the stuff that i've done is raising the money to or saving the money to to pay for art um doing a lot of the marketing uh, myself and and all that kind of stuff that you know you don't really think about until you're you're putting the book together. You're like, all right, well, you know, once this is done, like, you know, we'll have to pitch it out. I, I have to pitch it out to publishers and see if that works, or if it, if you know, if we're not pitching it out to publishers, we have to figure out a crowdfunding campaign. I think it's again like that we don't do uh, a lot of the heavy lifting that we just write the script and then it's on to the next one. That it's not that at all. Like this, this book has been living in my brain um, since we started it uh, over a year ago at this point. Hey everybody, this is Casey Allen, co-creator of Voodoo Child, and you are watching Two Geeks Talking. Hi, this is Peter Woods, co-creator of Voodoo Child, and you're watching Two Geeks Talking. In what early experience... Did you learn that language had power? I love these questions, Kurt. They're good, man. Uh, I suppose the, my early experience with language having power was uh, when I was in, I don't know what you guys, we call it junior school here, like the school you go to before you go to high school. For, I was brought up very evangelical Christian and like swearing just wasn't in my household at all. So much so that I was like on the school playground, I just wouldn't swear, I just wouldn't do it. But I used to get picked on for this. I remember one time being held up against the wall, like by this um, girl two grades above me, and she had me around the neck and she was like picking on me. And I was just like, why don't you just F off? And <laughs> she, was, she was so shocked by me using that language that she basically stopped picking on me because she was just like, oh, okay, he is human after all, and like not a complete douche. And yeah, I suppose that would be more my first experiences of like what you can achieve through language. Around the same age, I went to a bookstore in uh, Birmingham, Alabama. They had a, um, a contest for worst opening line to a detective novel. So of course, you know, if you don't know how to write anything you write is going to probably be one of the worst anyway. I was around 11 or 12. I put my thing in the bucket that, you know, my line a few weeks later, I got a call that I had gotten second place. The first place was a local writer named Robert R. McCammon, who, uh, if you're into horror, he has done some pretty big books. So he, he wrote Boy's Life, Gone South, ton of other like really good horror and horror adjacent books. Realizing that uh, my bad opening line was almost as good as a professional writer's bad opening line gave me all the confidence I needed to write more bad opening lines. <laughs> you remember what the line was? It was a dark and stormy night. A dame walked into my office. She was ugly, real ugly, which is cheating <laughs> because that's totally more than an opening line. Uh, his was get it up, cried the gal with the gat. They were nice enough to give me the, uh, the benefit of the doubt because I'm sure my handwriting looked like that of an 11-year-old. Hey, I mean, 
take take wins where you can get exactly them. exactly it's, it set you on this particular path hey guys i am rylan grant the ringo award winning creator of fine comics like aberrant banjacks and now suicide jockeys and you are watching two geeks talking beat this question up with them and what i kept hearing back from teachers that you know i now really kind of i'm all in with and fully respect is like somebody's going to write action movies somebody's going to write comic books and they would say i feel a lot more comfortable it being a person like you who is actually sitting here asking these questions right what effect do my movies have on the world at large like what am i putting out into the universe right and how is that going to be twisted and turned and used how is that going to move someone this way or that way just embracing the idea of okay well you have a um you're on a stage now and people are paying attention to you. People are listening to you. People are reading your books and watching your movies. What are you going to do with that power, right? What is your responsibility to the world? Um, and so I think, you know, when you ask me like what, what, what effect has it had, first and foremost, that's it, is that um, I have kind of come to terms with what an enormous responsibility uh, it is to, um, to have people reading your books, to, to have people watching movies that you've written. And, um, and so, yeah, I take that very seriously you've heard my taste in movies, right? <laughs> you know, oh, yeah. I mean, I, 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 I love, I, I mean, there's nothing more noble than entertaining people. I'm not snooty about it. I'm not, you know, uh, um, you know, I, I, I'm not stodging about any of this stuff. Um, you know, I, I like fun. And so, you know, however, it's like, um, you just have to, you have to be a little conscious about, about what you're putting out there. And so I've taken that very seriously. And I think more than anything, it's like, um, what it's done is, you know, just 15 plus years of Zen practice. I mean, probably 20 plus years of Buddhism and, you know, 30 odd years of, of just, you know, searching in general. Um, it's just taught me to kind of ask big questions and to try to get to the bottom of things. And so, like, I don't think it's enough to just have, like, actually nonsense where people are kind of shooting up stuff. Like, um, every one of my issues, even if it is a, a hollow at the moon, like, you know, fucking roller coaster ride. Um, I'm asking a big philosophical existential question in that issue and wrestling with it. And it is about people like me and people like us sorting their shit out. Um, I think if you're going to write one of these things, it might as well be about something. And it, 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 if you're going to ask people to spend money on a book or, you know, point down the $37 or whatever it is for a movie ticket these days, you might as well give them something meaningful. Uh, it is your duty to give them something meaningful. And the gift Zen gave to me was, okay, well, uh, what do I have to say? And then let me take a long look at how I now, let me figure out how to say that, right? So I think that that's, that's the gift Zen has given to me. And, and, and the funny thing is, I mean, some of this stuff I've, I've um, some of this stuff I've kind of explored in my own mind before. I mean, certainly the like, oh, what is my responsibility? But um, Zen preparing me for things in this way, I, I don't know that I've explored before. So this is interesting. Thank you for that. <laughs> Hi, I'm Leslie Julian, co-writer of Savage Wizard, and you're watching Two Geeks Talking. Hey, this is Brian Flint. I'm the illustrator for Savage Wizard, and you're watching Two Geeks Talking. What was an early experience where you learned that language had power? Ooh, good question. Um, I guess, um, without thinking too hard about it, um, I remember it was probably like first or second grade. Um, we had like a little school magazine or something like that or school newsletter. And um, I think they asked us to do like short stories. And I guess there was like a, a short story contest and, and I submitted something. And I think it actually was, you know, it, it got like a pretty decent standing, like maybe like second or third place, like out of the, the whole school. And I just remember feeling like, wow, like people like my stuff other than me. Like, that's pretty cool. <laughs> that's a that's a tough one. I've never been asked that question before. That's a good one. Yeah, language has power. Um, yeah, I don't know how to answer that, to be honest. Uh, more recently, actually, I feel like it's become super clear that language and words and how you phrase things change, you know, people's reactions to stuff. Same facts, different, you know, way of putting it definitely changes how people receive information and visual language has definitely been something that I've been not struggling, but working my, you know, very hard to get a good handle on. I've been trying my best to, to learn and use, you know, visual language to tell the story a lot more than just kind of relying on 
the text in the bubble and stuff like that to try to get an underlying message going as well. You know, uh, that was actually a lot trickier than, than I thought it would be, you know, not just changing a facial expression, but where someone stands, where someone stands in relation to another character, all that stuff, you know, all the storytelling stuff that they want you to know as a comic book artist. <laughs> Hi, I'm Scott Reed. I am the writer, artist, and publisher of Hark. It is a six-issue miniseries. First issue is out right now. You can go to uh, beyondforwardcomics.com. And you are watching Two Geeks Talking. What is the most misunderstood aspect about this particular industry of comics? Oh, geez. There are several. Uh, you know, there's that there's a lot of money in it. <laughs> and it's like, where, where, when are we going to start making a lot of money in comics? Because now, you know, comics are, are part of pop culture. You know, we've got, um, you know, they've kind of finally become their own genre in film and TV. And so it's become this mainstream thing. Um, and I, I think maybe it's starting to trickle down a little bit into the, the comics industry on, on one or two levels. Um, but it's definitely a tough, it's a very tough field to, to work in over a long period of time, you know, without having to kind of segue into pivot, you know, into other professions. Uh, and I've, I've definitely done that myself. You know, I've worked in comics. I can say I've worked in comics for a long time, but I've also worked outside of comics for a long time. And I think that's kind of the new norm for creators young and and not so young um that you just kind of have to you know you kind of have to be able to pivot quickly because the work is not always it's not always going to be there what have you done outside the industry that uh well that you can talk about uh, i'm a graphic designer and so i've been i've worked as a graphic designer for as long as i've worked in comics i've it's always been kind of a hand in hand thing for me um working in, in uh print and digital, you know, doing uh, graphic work and, and web design work um, is something I'm also like really super passionate about. It's, it's definitely um, a career that I love. And the great thing about it is I've been able to kind of incorporate those skill sets into my comic work over the years, being able to kind of like, you know, marketing, do, doing my own uh, marketing work. You know, I, I have those, that, that's kind of in my wheelhouse too. Hi, this is Lex Fajardo, creator of Kid Beowulf, which you can find at kidbeowulf.com and the upcoming uh, storybook, Hom the Pigs, Big Adventure. And you've been watching Two Geeks Talking. You have to improve. I mean, or else why, why do you keep doing it? Right. I don't think I'd still be doing this show if I didn't get past my fear of talking with people within the first couple of years, this couple of years. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That and being an introvert didn't help. You say this book is the book that basically you've leveled up on. What was the hardest scene for you to write? Oh, okay. Well, I don't know if this is a spoiler or not. So I'll try and be as delicate as possible. The Tarpeian Rock, it's, it's, that's the title of, of book four. I can't help but, but give a little bit of a, of a history course, so forgive me. But... In Rome, there's this thing called the Tarpeian Rock. It overlooks the, the Roman Forum. And the origin story of Rome is after the twin brothers, Romulus and Remus, um, choose the site of Rome, after which Remus is killed by his own brother uh, in sort of a family squabble about who, who would actually, you know, who would they name their, the city for, who would become its leader. Um, so there's later on, there's this conflict between the Latins, who are the who who is Rome, uh, Romulus and Remus, and then the Sabines, who is this neighboring tribe, and um, there's sort of a siege around uh, early Rome, and uh, a general is trying to get in. The, the Sabine general is trying to to get into the into the the city, uh, and one night he's he's walking around the perimeter trying to figure out how does he, how do, how can he get his men in. He spots this young girl who is who's walking um, inside the walls of Rome, and he sort of you know, brings her over and he says, young girl, if you'll open the gates, I'll give you all that's on our shield arms. And they have these beautiful, you know, golden bracelets and whatnot. And so this young girl named Tarpeia opens the gate. She doesn't know any better. And of course the Sabines trample her. Um, and she's sort of trampled on the spot. War ensues. Uh, eventually the Romans win. And actually uh, they, they form a peace with the Sabines and they, and they, 
and they combine their tribes. But the treachery of Tarpeia is not forgotten. So what they do is they take Tarpeia, this young girl, and fling her off this rock. And therefore, from, from, ever, from that point on, it's called the Tarpeian Rock, and that's where they would fling criminals and traitors to, to Rome and, and whatnot. Um, and it's still there today. You can, you can go and see the Tarpan Rock above the, the Roman Forum. It's pretty grisly. Like a lot of those 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 stories were, were were pretty grisly. But I remember when I was reading this story, I always felt like, well, what? Who was Tarpeia? You know, there are so many women in classical mythology in these stories who get short shrift, who who are blamed for one thing, but really, like, you know, are they to blame? Did they actually betray? You know, and so that was really the seed for the story. I was I wanted to kind of look at the origins of Rome through the lens of this young girl, Tarpeia. And in my universe, she's, she's actually um, not, not a true sibling to Romulus and Remus, but sort of like an adopted young sister. And so it's sort of their story and, 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 the, and the interactions they have. Um, and so this is a long, story, a long way to sort of get to, the, to your main question about what is the hardest scene to write. And it was really towards the climax where we have that final confrontation between Romulus and Remus. Cause that was the other thing I wanted to explain is like, what would drive two brothers who grew up with each other, um, you know, who, who love each other to start to fight, you know, what, what, what would be that, that, that thing that, that comes between them. And so, um, and so getting to that moment in the story and making it feel believable uh, where, you know, the reader actually, um, understood the stakes and and what was going to come was really challenging and I think I pulled it off. Um, um, uh, again, I don't want to give away the big spoiler, but that was a hard scene to sort of manipulate and 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 make sure all the pieces of the hundred pages prior to it um, fell into place and that the payoff at the end is worth it. Hi, I'm A.C. Sedgwick, fantasy author and host of Fabulous Folklore, and you're watching Two Geeks Talking. Is there a difference between religion and folklore? Oh, oh, um, I'm I'm going to go out on a limb and say yes. Um, and I think I'm trying to think how to say this so I don't offend anyone. Um, generally so speaking, knows. the way I mean, folklore tends to be sort of the shared traditions, beliefs, and practices of a community. Um, I think that's pretty much how folklore Thursday define it anyway. Um, whereas religions tend to be more codified in terms of what lies within its remit. And it's more something that I don't want to say is imposed from above because that's the wrong word, but it's kind of, it's like a set of, of beliefs or whatever that you come to and that already exist, whereas folklore can spring up from anywhere. People can explore it and take it on. And and I think to me, religion's just more organized in that regard. Whereas, and obviously this isn't all religions, this is just the, the, the ones I'm familiar with. Well, one I'm familiar with, having been brought up um, Protestant. Um, whereas I think folklore is a bit more adaptable um, and you just need to look at something like the way that the Slender Man myth took off to show how people can just come up with something that people will follow or um, get involved with in some shape or form. Whereas I think religion, because there's a, a stronger set of guidelines, as it were, um, you're less likely to colour outside of the lines, I guess, is where I'm going with that. Hey, everybody, Dan Price with Bigfoot Knows Karate. Uh, check us out on October 13th on Kickstarter, or you can check us out on www.bigfootknowskarate.com. You have been watching Two Geeks Talking. Hey, everybody, this is Casey Allen, and I am the co-writer of the amazing book, Bigfoot Knows Karate. Find us at bigfootknowskarate.com and keep your eyes peeled for our Kickstarter uh, coming out on October 13th. You guys be there, and you're watching Two Geeks Talking. What is one piece of advice that someone has told you that stuck with you in your career that's made you better? Todd Nock told me one time when you're drawing – I mean, I got two pieces for you. Todd Nock told me one time that if you're, uh, you're drawing a page – sing your panels, okay, to, you know, every note that you're – every different note makes a different sound uh, every note that you make it's different from each other you know it's a different si size of the panel break so it's like uh 
headshot is boom, and then you know the the small the wide shot is bing, you know. And so when you you shouldn't make the four same notes on a page, basically, is what he was saying. Is so every page should look different. And I don't know why the, the noise thing works so well for me, but I still do it to this day. I'll go when I'm getting done laying out a page, I go bing bong bing boom boom. You know what I mean? And just making silly noises, and it's something that kind of stuck with me i don't know why i do it uh, yeah the road to comics hell is paved with good intentions meaning that do not you know a lot of people will promise you a lot of things in this industry you know that you you'll be bigger than jack kirby kid i never heard that one but a lot of times they don't have the ability to make those make those statements you know actually happen and that's okay because the only thing that's really going to make that happen for you is uh you know practice preparation and uh and uh timing that's what's going to make that work for you so walk walk softly when you're in the world of comics you know pay attention keep your lips closed your ears open and uh make sure that you're not getting hurt along the way because as somebody who's been kicked in the teeth a couple of times in the world of comics it's not fun i definitely handle it differently than i did back then that's for sure uh wh one of the best pieces of advice i got was um on ostrander uh, I, I interviewed him for spoiler country and uh super nice guy he was telling me just how important it was to uh kind of make sure that you give each character a voice to kind of treat that that character with respect as you, as you as you go about your business um you they're not all cookie cutter shapes to play around with um, and that's one thing I've, I've tried to, to keep in mind as I, as I go about my, go about my writing. Hi, my name is Rachel Allen Everett, and I'm the creator of the Manderfield Devil, and you're watching Two Geeks Talking. What was the hardest scene to write in this particular book, though? Ah, that's a good question. I think the hardest scene, the one that I kept coming back to was the confrontation between Leslie and Oasis, the witch. Leslie comes to face Oasis, and I had to really carefully select Oasis's um, words to Leslie to make sure that the message was communicated clearly. As far as emotional impact, let's see, the emotional scenes. There, there were certain beats throughout the story that I really wanted to make sure resonated with people. I wanted Leslie's pent up anger to really come across throughout. I wanted her to appear cool, calm and collected when you first interact with her and then to just watch it boil over throughout the comic. Um, and with Detective Hogan, I wanted him to remain stoic, but also have these moments where like, for example, he's out on the street and a bird flies in front of him right after he's like, I'll nab this crook and these people are crazy. And then the bird like flies over him and distracts his thinking i wanted these constant moments where it's like are you sure about that hogan like are you really sure that you don't believe in this kind of stuff i was trying to really weave in those kinds of feelings and, and thought processes without, without really saying much about them mostly just showing it hey there i'm mike kingston the uh, writer and creator of headlock comics and you are watching two geeks talking a comic book creator once told me what was the hardest scene for you to write in this particular book what is the wisest piece of advice that someone has ever said to you that stuck with you in your career at san diego comic-con that they don't make soap for your soul <laughs> it really has kind of stuck with me you know I, I try to do everything the right way and i try to not step on people i try to lift people up i try not to promote it you know like it just Try to, I try to be a good person and exist. I don't even know why that stuck with me. All those, one of the other ones is as a, as a writer, I guess as any kind of a creator is you need to know the difference between when it's finished and when it's done. You know, sometimes you can spend hours. I mean, when I first started out, I, I remember spending a whole night sort of changing three words in a piece of dialogue, just back and forth to figure out what the, what the perfect way to do it is sometimes Sometimes it just has to be done. Hi, this is T. Gary Peterson of Deliverance. You can find me at tgarypeterson.com. Also on Twitter, hey underscore TGP. And you're watching Two Geeks Talking. What was an early experience where you learned that language had power? Wow, that's a good question too. 
I'm going to say from watching Star Wars, honestly, because that movie really helped shape my um, creativity and my imagination as a person. I think it all goes back to Star Wars for a lot of people. For a lot of people, I was going to say a lot of people around my age, but people older than me, I mean, ever since 77, I think there's always going to be a little bit of Star Wars and everything that I've written, even if it's not super, super noticeable. Star Wars at its very core, I think, is all about family. It's also a father and son story. It's also about parents and their children. I am your father. It's a powerful moment. That's funny. You're making me remember when I was a young kid. Um, there's this Benjamin Franklin quote where he says something. It's something like, the pen hurts mightier than the sword. The you, pen is mightier than the sword. It made me realize that you can physically hurt someone, obviously. You could stab someone and they could bleed out and die. But to like really hurt someone, to hurt them on the inside, you just you use your words. Like Your words are so much sharper and so much more powerful. And you can. You can really change someone's entire day with a few words the written word it captures some of that but it like leaves so much of it out too like it doesn't capture all of it that was a good question <laughs> oh, oh there's more <laughs> hi i'm phil myra i'm currently on kickstarter with all three volumes of crackle crackle is a self-published self-contained anthology series all sorts of room by myself and i've been lucky to collaborate with artists from all over the world and you can find it at cracklecomics.com or just on Kickstarter at Crackle Volume 3. And you're watching Two Geeks Talking. As a writer, though, what themes in these stories spoke to you? I mean, the two main themes that I explore, time and mortality, it deals with us as humans dealing with the passage of time there's some type of growth, even if it's negative growth. I think that's the best way to put it. Mortality, because that's the finite end, at least from one perspective, our, either the character's perspective or our perspective, even within the story. A few times I've used montages. I use montages in a specific way to show points within that character's life, kind of how I was touching upon before, where there is a flashback sequence with four panels. Those four panels have have very specific things doing inside them. They're, it's not there to show the person's progression. It does do that, but it also shows their point in time because that's, that's always interesting because a comic book is multiple points in time. Hi, I'm Rob Malteri. I'm the creator and writer of Snowpaw and the hit series Nightwolf. You can find me at uh, Lone Wolf Comics, on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, uh, lonewolfcomics.com, or at Rob Malteri, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And you're watching Two Geeks Talking. What exactly is your kryptonite as a writer? Because you did mention Batman and DC and all that. Uh, so as a writer, like, I think time is my biggest kryptonite. Um, I, you know, I have between full-time job, family, and then doing this. And basically not only am I writing, I'm promoting, I'm, I'm, I'm wearing the business hat, I'm ordering the books, I'm, you know, I'm the graphic and web designer, for, you know, like I'm the promoter, you know what I mean? Like I, I basically do everything but the art side of the pages. And um, I think that's, to me, that's my biggest time constraint. But I also use my attention deficit, I think, as a superpower. Um, I've learned how to work best with it. Um, so when I find myself... Uh, getting like to, to prevent the distracted part of things. I always listen to music while I'm working and whether it's sometimes I have to crank it up really high. Like when I'm doing like graphic design, I like to have it high and then, you know, while I'm moving stuff around, cause I think it kind of helps me get motivated. Um, but then when I'm writing, I like to turn it down and just have it to kind of be that background noise to block out like random house noises or kids screaming or, you know what I mean? Stuff like that. Um, it's, but like when I get my focus kind of shifts from what I'm doing to something else. So like I have, you can see like there's one monitor right here, but like the cam, you know, my camera's here because this is a different computer. This over here, like I'm on an L shaped desk and I have a, um, I have a, a windows a PC over here with three monitors. And then I have a Macintosh um, being a web designer. I, I test things on both platforms. 
but like the, so this is how I work. Like I'm like, looking at all three you know like that so like because of my distraction like sometimes like my focus will move i'm working on multiple things at the same time (laughs) i'm the best multitasker in the world that's my mutant power (laughs) hi there my name is logan lachane i'm a fantasy author of into ebonmore and you are watching two geeks talking So then in terms of creating this particular world that, that Jordy has gone to, then, you know, what did you use to create that? Okay, so that that's a good question. The actual truthful basis for this world, it actually started when I was quite young. And I'm really, really bad at things like geography. So I wanted to create a world that no one could come to me and be like, that's not where that is, or it doesn't take that long to travel to that place. So like when I was in my teens, I created this world basically as the lazy out to keep myself from from doing actual research. But it ended up becoming something so much more than that. And I kept building on this world to the point where at, at one time, my brother and I actually took all these different little books that I had written and we mapped it out and it actually worked you know nothing was on top of where something else should have been and that kind of thing and we we made this big map and then we kind of realized like wow we've we've created a whole world here like there there's a lot going on and there's all these different places and they're so detailed unfortunately i i no longer have any of that i don't have the map i don't have any of the books that i wrote when i was in my teens uh, so it was all completely a uh, clean slate when it came to starting this story, but I still had the world in my head, so it was easy to describe. Hi, I'm Lawrence Goodman, uh, writer of Grey Cells, and you're watching Two Geeks Talking. Hi, I'm Kay, I'm the artist of Grey Cells, and you're watching Two Geeks Talking. It's actually Thank Three Geeks Talking. Isn't it Three Geeks Talking? We ruined your show, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's two geeks and a guy that... That asks you questions. I'm always <laughs> plus one. Why, they, oh, it's, it's the same as with my wife. I'm always plus one. Basically, Kurt, yeah. Kurt, we're giving you gold here. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but I still have to edit all this together to make it cohesive. Yes, we appreciate it. <laughs> what is your creative kryptonite? Not only for as a writer, but as an artist. You know, I'll, I'll come up with a thing, and then I, I, I have to challenge myself to not be obvious with the next step. When I was younger and I was trying to write, I would end up writing something that was really generic. And then I'd see it on TV like a a little while later. And I was was like, oh, for God's sake, I'm I'm just following on to the next next step. And then I I started challenging myself that you've got to try and upend the the expectations slightly and and go a a different route. And uh, we we were joking around earlier before we came on about uh, this is horror, not comedy, but they've got a lot of overlap. It's, it's both of them are going against what your expectation is. So the, the story is the, the world is okay. It's, it's, it's progressing along at uh, a certain linear narrative and then something unexpected takes you out of that and takes you onto a, an, into another story. And in a comedy, that's, that's funny. That's, you know, someone getting a pie in the face. Um, horror, that's someone getting a knife in the face. You know, it's... I will just um, quote Big John Buscema, who said, goddamn cars and skyscrapers. Cars and skyscrapers. Perspective, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And Lawrence made me draw a bunch of cars. <laughs> Here's one. Specific- Why the hesitation to go to digital? Um, I love digital. I... I have- I appreciate a lot of digital artists. Um, um, it's just that uh, it's two things. I've never seen anything done digital that cannot be done traditional. So I'm talking about, about old masters like Alberto Breccia, and I'm talking about new superstars like uh, Sean Gordon Murphy. So they're still working traditional. Um, I, I, don't, I don't see anything. And the second one is the happy accidents, the aforementioned happy accidents. Now, digitally, you can create brushes. You can create any effect that, and reproduce it in Photoshop, in whatever program you're working in. But then it keep, it, it's a pattern that keeps repeating, you know, and you never, you, you know, you never make a new one. You, you cannot make it by accident. Um, the good side is, of course, you never ruin a whole page. 
you know, just by <laughs> knocking over your ink bottle. Uh, it's a bit like the argument with with music, where you got digital and, and analog. And my friend's a musician, and and he says that you can never accurately recreate an analog sound with a digital thing because it it, it cuts off a a, cl- a clean edge. Whereas um, analog, with where he's talking about music with sine waves and stuff, that it's it's a curve and it's a it's a constant. Uh, a constant round edge and i think that's the same that you can see in the the line work and the the art you've uh you can perfectly reproduce something digitally and it will it will look fantastic but just that edge will always be slightly different when it's it's manual when it's uh when it's a physical thing and and uh, you know like a, a a little bit of ink dripping somewhere and then suddenly you've got some inspiration to to go off or it forces you to to do something slightly different, you haven't got that undo button. I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm not. I, I actually <laughs> like about the, how digital looks on screen because it's made for screen. It's not actually made for paper. So once you, you know, once you do this, it, it still looks the same. Yeah. But if you do this with traditional media, all the lines look jagged um, because they're made for paper and you have to keep the format in the size in mind and everything. And that's why we are planning on doing, uh, the print edition. Mm-hmm. In looking at the artists that you got for this book, which style was your favorite? You know, I went back to my nightmare world days about finding the best artist to suit each chapter of the story. You know, so like Scott James did the WCW one. Scott draws really big, exaggerated characters, you know, and stuff like that. So he was he did one of the chapters which focused on a lot of the WCW guys with the Hogan Sting and things like that. Yeah. You mentioned DJ Kaufman. Working with DJ Kaufman, something I wanted to do for all my career. DJ was one of the guys I looked up to when I was getting started. You know, he was a little bit ahead of me, and and he was definitely a big inspiration to me in a lot of the stuff he did. So to work with him was a high mark, and, and DJ is. Amazing. Professional is professional. Yeah. You know, when DJ did the first chapter of the book, he had, <laughs> he must have had like 20 reference photos and stuff right off the bat. He's like, here's my folder with all my reference photos. I was sharing his references with the other artists, you know. <laughs> um, it was good to jam with Josh Ross again. Uh, Austin McKinley's doing Tales of Mystery Volume 5, so he snuck a story in here first. Um, uh, oh my gosh. You know, Ani is, fa- I mean, I, I, I love working with them all in different ways, but if you're going to put me on the spot, you know, again, working with DJ was a highlight because I wanted to work with him forever. Um, Colm Griffin, I've never got to work with. It was really cool to work with him. Mariana Pescosta doing the standard cover. Mariana, you know, Ringo Award nominated artist, uh, Haunted High Ons. She's so great. Uh, uh, Sally Scott's fantastic. I'm going to be doing more work with her in the next year. I, I, Jan Apple, again, doing so. <laughs> I'm just going to start running through the list. I'm going to forget someone look like a jerk, but it was all fun in different ways. But but DJ really impressed me. It was fun to it was fun to work with him. And it's always good to jam with my boy Josh Ross again, as well as Austin McKinley and Lynn. And... Sorry, man, I'm going to keep going. So <laughs> I'm going to like have to bring up the list and go through. <laughs> I, I, was, I was just about to do that on, on the Kickstarter page there, just, just so I had it. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, obviously, you know, with this book, you have to edit things out. What did you edit out of this book? You know, I brought, I, one of the things I did is I brought in, you know, Drina Joe, fantastic editor. She edits Broken Gargoyles for Source Point Press. Uh, she had some other stuff that's coming out with Source Point. She had taught at High Ons. So I left a lot of the editing to her. <laughs> but because we had the economy of the 10 pages per chapter, really it was just about tightening up a few scenes. You know, um, not my first rodeo about writing short stories, obviously. I, I built a lot of my career on that. Again, to keep bringing it up, we're going back to like Nightmare World. You know, I mean, that's and even the first volume of Tales of Mystery, that was kind of my jam. So there wasn't a lot. You know, the only thing is, after the whole book was done and things like that, Tony and I were doing a podcast together and he talked about the story that got him involved in wanting to be a sports announcer. Mm. And he's telling this story and I'm sitting there and I'm, I'm listening to it and I'm literally doing this. Like, I'm like, how did we talked for a year? How did this story never come up? It's incredible. I would have put that at the beginning of the book, you know? So I guess the other thing we got edited out was something that never came up because it really starts with Tony's a teenager watching wrestling with his uncle John 
ended up to his time in AEW. So I guess that was an inadvertent edit, like this very sentimental, fantastic story. We've joked around that if we ever do an uh, expanded deluxe version or something, I would want to put that in. But that was that was about it. Other than that, it was pretty pretty straightforward. I mean, there was never anything that we um, had to take out because we were burying anybody or anything like that. Yeah, right. So. It was pretty pretty seamless, pretty pretty boring in that sense. Uh, Junior uh, Joe might have a totally different answer. Uh, what is the equivalent of kryptonite in the Marvel universe? I think you might have me stumped. What what is the equivalent of kryptonite in the Marvel universe? Oh my goodness. Hey, fellow geeks, this is Eddie D'Angelini, the writer, artist, and creator of the comic strip Collectors and co-owner of Heidi Ho Comics in Santa Monica, California, and you are watching Two Geeks Talking. As a creative person, what is your kryptonite? Uh, gosh, time. Because it always seems to get away from me. And I find myself procrastinating more than I should a lot of the times. And it's always a thought of, oh, well, I can start that tomorrow. And then tomorrow comes and you think, well, I, I can start it tomorrow. Yeah, I think with any creator, kryptonite, their kryptonite is always organization of their creative time. None of us are able to be able to do this like literally as a full-time basis and be their only job. Only just, I mean, there's only maybe like a tiny few who can. So a lot of us are working other jobs. A lot of us are doing other responsibilities. So carving out a dedicated amount of time every day, every week to do just their creative endeavors is probably honestly the hardest thing. You know, once you get that ball rolling, you can sustain that role, but getting that ball rolling in that aspect has always been the hardest thing. But when you get started, the hardest thing is literally to get that giant boulder moving. But once it's moving, it's like, hey, this isn't so hard. Hi, my name is Madeline Holly Rosing. I'm the writer creator of the steampunk supernatural series, Boston Metaphysical Society. We're currently running a Kickstarter for our first ever audio drama called The Ghost Ship, which you can find at kickstarter.com or through our website. And you're watching Two Geeks Talking. What didn't you know about audio drama that will improve you as a creative person? Thinking about space in which the characters live, I guess a deeper sense of where they live on an, an audio level. And I mean, obviously as a writer, you, you write that in prose, you write that in, in everything you do. Um, as a writer, no matter what the medium. But I think writing an audio drama script really brought that home on how sounds can tell us when the power in the scene has changed. It's a different kind of mindset when writing an, an audio drama script. It, it is a communication document like a comic book script is. As you know, a comic book script is, is literally a, a communication document to your artist, your letterer, your colorist, um, possibly pre-production, that all goes into the script. And much is the same, but different in an audio drama, because here you're communicating to your actors and to your audio engineer. It's just interesting how a script boils down to when, when it's a collaborative event, you know, unlike a novel, which is just for you and the reader that this is a collaborative environment. And so you have to write a clear document that other people can understand and then execute. Hi, this is uh, Ryan Dross, the writer and creator of Stealth Hammer, the all ages superhero adventure comic. And you're listening to and watching Two Geeks Talking. You know, what is the most important quality of a writer and an artist, especially in a collaborative effort like this for writing and drawing comics today? I think the most important thing um, is communication and being open to criticism. I'm a new writer, so I'm still learning. I definitely feel like my issue two is stronger than my issue one looking at it, but being open to those critiques. And I would say my team is very open to that. I am very open to that. I've had Joel come back to me on both issues and say, hey, because he's reading it cold. And he's like, this 
isn't totally clear. Is this what you meant to go for? And I'll, I'll go, oh yeah, that's what I meant. You know, I'll make adjustments and everything else. And there's times where I'll be like, hey, this, this looks like this to me. And he's like, oh, you know what? Yeah, you're right. Never saw it that way. Let me go ahead and do that. So I think that's one of the most important things that you're communicating with each other and that you are open to critiquing because I really think, sad to say, but I think nowadays people view critiquing as criticism or, or negative criticism. Criticism is good, but negative criticism isn't so much. It's not helpful when really you should always view any type of uh, feedback as, as a gift. It's a, it's, it's a way to get better. Greetings, ladies, gentlemen, and that wonderful prism in between. My name is Kennedy Phillips. I am what you would call a sound designer, which is just a fancy word for saying I bang pots together for a living. I've worked on Magus Elgar, Husband Hotel, Hell of a Boss, Satina, and many more animations. You are watching Two Geeks Talking. Stay tuned. Why was this story and this program uh, important to be created? This was ultimately a test to see if I could direct. I, I wanted to do something that was a little bit more impactful, meatier, I suppose would be a word for it, than just like, can I direct? I really don't like half-assing things. I really don't like having to do something where I just say that's good enough. When I was growing up, I was diagnosed with dysgraphia. Uh, you know how like what your your brain jumbles up words when you're reading text? Dysgraphia kind of does the same thing in reverse where like you're trying to translate to writing. You try to draw a straight line and it kind of like goes <laughs> But I always would feel that wiggle in everything I would do. This is very much done by someone who doesn't know what they're doing kind of feel. That drove me crazy. So I said, all right, if I'm going to direct something, I want to make sure that it is as high quality, as polished as I can possibly make it. I want this to be... A, a magnum opus of what I am capable of doing at this present time. So I put like all my life savings into this and dove full force into trying to make this as best as I could make it. And, you know, I wanted to have like fun creating something that I, I would love to watch. I really wanted to make my own world, but something that was as absurd as the places that I fell in love with, exploring the nature of magic, the the way that the planets shaped actually tells a little bit of uh, like how ridiculous this world is, where it's the, the whole world of Magus Elgar is about something that you feel like you understand until you get a closer look at it. One, one of my favorite jokes that I came up with really early on that kind of spells a lot about how the world of Hearth kind of works. In my setting, uh, two scientists find themselves in the magical world of Hearth, a banana-shaped planet that spins between two, that, that uh, boomerangs between two, star, uh, two stars that circle each other. The doctor in that show, Dr. Gra Horatio, uh, expresses to Magus Elgar, my main character, about how complicated science is, that sometimes we don't know all the answers. And he explained this through uh, the, the quantum theory of uh, zero shift, which is the idea that the rules change, the rules to the laws of physics change just by observing it. Which is such a really like mind bending concept in science of like, why is it that us watching it changes the rules of reality? For somebody like Magus Elgar, who lives in the world of Hearth, he goes, well, it makes perfect sense. You're giving them stage fright. <laughs> it's, it's something that like seems like such a simple explanation, but it's just batshit insane if you were looking at it from a scientific perspective. Hello, this is Dirk Manning here, the writer and creator of Tales of Mystery, Nightmare World, Hope, and many, many other comics. And uh, you're watching Two Geeks Talking, which is amazing. So uh, enjoy. Why do you think it's taken the big two or, or image or any of those larger publishers to either warm up to the Kickstarter idea? I think a lot of it's backlash from social media. Lest we forget, back in the day when Archie Comics tried to launch a Kickstarter. Oh, yeah. Remember that? Oh, People yeah. lost their minds. They're like, why does Archie need to do a Kickstarter? You're crowding out the little people, blah, blah, blah. 
I wanted to say to people, when's the last time you bought an Archie comic? Uh, no offense to Archie. No offense to Archie. But a lot of these people that were saying, oh, you know, Archie doesn't need to do this. They're an established brand. It's like, well, they're established, but they're, find, they're trying to find a way to reinvigorate themselves as a, as a publisher and access a new model and access a new, a new market. What, what's interesting now is that like uh, with Boom, with Berserker, with Keanu Reeves, same thing. All these people went nuts about it, you know, uh, in positive ways and negative ways. I mean, they had a monster campaign and people, but, but a lot of creators were like, oh, great. Now Keanu Reeves is here. He's crowding us out. Mm-hmm. Again, it's democracy in action, friends. Another example, and, and I, I, I've never spoken on this publicly, but uh, Elvira doing her comics or do the, doing the comics with her on Kickstarter. I don't know the numbers on the Elvira comics. I know Elvira's uh, a, a franchise that has had many comics to many different publishers over the years. And again, and I'm speaking on a turn here. I, I hope someone will take the time to politely correct me, but I, I'm going to hypothesize that those Elvira comics always did. Okay. Yeah, I'm sure they did. Okay. You know, I, I, I love Elvira. You know, I, I think she, she's fantastic. She was formative on my, career in a lot of ways, personally, professionally, you know, and I love everything she stands for. But when they started taking the Elvira comics to Kickstarter, they're seeing monster numbers in their pre-sales. And I'm willing to bet that they saw just as much, if not more, sales on Kickstarter up front than they did on the run of some of these comics later. Because again, there's all these people who never walked into a comic shop but then found out, I really like Elvira. She's got a comic. I can prove it on this Kickstarter thing. That's pretty awesome. And you get Elvira to drop a promo to, boom, go. Or when we look at myself with uh, Butts and Seats, the Tony Giovanni story, right? I can't tell you how many people have never read a comic before, but they jumped in on the crowdfunding because they specifically wanted to support Tony Giovanni. Kickstarter is a is a new distribution model. And it's a way for people to directly connect with the brand and directly connect with, with the work. I, I think that's exciting. And in regards to major publishers doing, I think it's trickier for like a Marvel or DC to do it because Marvel or DC builds their brands around properties more than creators. Hmm. That's not a slam. That's just the reality. They're gonna promote Spider-Man and they'll say, okay, this guy or this girl, whomever is working on Spider-Man. And when that person leaves, they're going to say, well, the next person is on Spider-Man or X-Men or whatever it is. So I I think with Marvel and DC specifically, it's going to be trickier for them to enter this arena because I think ultimately crowdfunding and Kickstarter is about against that democracy in action. And there's a personal connection there, supporting people you like. You know you're getting a book from me. You know you're supporting a book by Tony Schiavone or Elvira, whatever. And it, and it creates a sense of connection there that I think a lot of people really, really appreciate. Let's just say there's a reason that I advocate for self-publishing over deal. If you want to make good comics, avoid bad publishers. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Anthony Reckazer, and I am the writer and creator of uh, The First Hero, Heroes of Homeroom C, and my current book, Chance for Survival. Uh, you can find the book at uh, kickstartthiscomic.com. And uh, you are watching or listening to Two Geeks Talking. What was it about Action Labs as as a writer yourself that initially seemed like an amazing deal and then it's turned to basically shit? See, here's the thing. It was a shit deal to begin with. And I just I just wasn't experienced enough to know that. The problem is, even if I had known that it was a shit deal, I might still have taken it. I would have gone into it a little differently, but I might still have taken it. I might have tried to, I might have tried to change more of the deal because there is language in that deal that I rewrote that they ended up using in other contracts. I don't know that I would have said no 
to them because it was my, it was the first deal I'd ever been offered. It was the opportunity to see my first comic book in public, uh, being published by a recognized publisher. I had gotten advice from a writer who was at uh, DC and image at the time that I was shopping the book around. And he said, uh, self-publishing ain't publishing at all. And I, the rest of his advice had been so good that I, <laughs> that I took this advice as well and sought out, like was determined to find, a, make a deal with a publisher. It's only the experience of having signed the deal and then, you know, going through the motions with them, going through those next few years that, um, that taught me definitively, don't throw away, don't give away a piece of your hard earned, your, your, your hard, hard fought, your heartfelt work in exchange for somebody's diamond code. It's just not worth it. And it was only in the doing, being in the middle of it, at, you know, actually sailing down that stream that I realized that, um, that the deal was so decidedly weighted in Action Lab's favor um, with just one provision that it's that it was almost inescapable and uh it's only having gone through that and said hey listen you know we're done here um what do i have to do to get my rights back so that i can you know move on whatever fashion i choose that i came up against um i came up against just bad faith business practices. Wisdom comes from making a mistake and learning from it. <laughs> this was a mistake that I, uh, that I made and I've been able to survive it and continue on. Um, but I certainly learned from it. I certainly learned from it. Hi, this is Montenero creator of Death Sentence and writer of comics for Marvel and others. I'm here to talk about Death Sentence Liberty, uh, the new Kickstarter that you can find live at the moment. And you're listening to this here on Two Geeks Talking. But what was the first thing that you wrote that you thought, yes, I could do this as a career? That's a good question. Um, I think it's always, it's always hard to uh, have a career as a writer. I mean, it's something that a lot of people want to do. It's obviously very competitive, so you know, that makes the working environment not, not very good. There's loads of people who want to do something and they're willing to put up with stuff, and that makes it hard for you to sort of get into that field. So, I mean, I had lots of things where I was getting paid to write. It never seemed really that... I should give up my job and go into it full time. Even when I was like getting paid to develop this um, screenplay into a film, I just thought this is way too kind of tenuous and nebulous and so, so much chance is involved in whether you get funding or not, whether you get greenlit or not. Yeah, and when you've got bills to pay and stuff, it's, uh, it's very hard to go into that. So I guess a lot, I, I think it's quite a good advice actually, or good practice anyway, is if you're a writer or an artist and you want to do that, Doing it full time isn't necessarily a good idea because if you do it full time for a start, you can't do the stuff you want to do. If you've got another job and then you've got time to sort of write and draw as well, so maybe it's a part time job, you know, that means that gives you a little bit of independence to actually make the stuff that you want to make. And I think it's very important in any creative field to be able to say no to people and to be able to tell them when an idea is dumb. Um, and if you haven't got the financial independence to do that because this is your only income and you have to just go along with it, then you end up writing all kinds of rubbish. That's not good. So I think probably the, the only time when I thought, like, oh, yeah, I, could, I should definitely do this as a career is when Death Sentence took off. After the first issue, Marvel got in touch with me and said, do you want to 
you know, pitch some ideas to us. And I just thought, well, Marvel getting in touch, then maybe there's a career here, you know? So um, I did send them some, some ideas and, and they picked up on a couple of them and, and we sort of ran with it. But I think ultimately I realized from that experience, what I wanted to do is I wanted to do comics like Death Sentence. I mean, that was what really got me excited. And uh, having that creative freedom and, and uh, self-expression and um, doing something that you really believe in, I think that's really what fires my engines. And increasingly, that's the way the kind of field of comics has gone, hasn't it? Where you get more and more and more creator-owned create stuff nowadays, whether it comes out through image or it comes out through crowdfunding or maybe both at the same time. Increasingly, the way the world's going is people are much... It's much easier for, like artists and writers to do their own thing and then to somehow get it to people in a way that they can make a living from it. Technology has kind of opened that up over the last sort of 10, 15 years. So, and that's a great trend. And you, you, you it often blows my mind to think like, wow, if Jack Kirby had been alive now, you know, what would he have created as far as his own universe with something like, you know, crowdfunding or, or create our own comics, it would just be mind blowing, you know, his family and him, he'd have been able to, you know, reap the full rewards of his talent. So yeah, I always feel very lucky to be alive in this time because, you know, I haven't got a hundredth of the talent of Jack Kirby, but I'm able to sort of make a living 